Hi, this is Rachel, and this is topic 12 of our supervision curriculum, Antecedent Strategies. So antecedent strategies are going to be strategies that we are using prior to any overly adapted behavior occurring. So behaviors that we might want to decrease um, or that are disruptive for the learner, um, what can we do to reduce the likelihood that those behaviors even occur in the first place? The first thing we're gonna talk about is behavioral momentum. So behavioral momentum is a technique where you engage or the individual engages in high probability behaviors followed then by the request to engage in a low probability behavior, then back to more high probability behaviors. So do things that the learner is likely to do, switch to one that maybe they're usually less likely to do, and then switch back to more highly likely to do. Um, you might see this, uh, for example, with preschoolers or kindergartners who are in a school learning some of the routines, like how to walk down the hall. Um, the teacher might say, okay, everybody uh, show me your airplane arms. Great, let's pretend to be airplanes. Okay, great. All right, now everybody uh, be an elephant. Okay, let's pretend to be an elephant. Okay, now everybody be a super secret spy and we're going to tiptoe down the hall. And so whereas re without that, um, the learners might be likely to be noisy and move around a lot in the hall with doing some of those high probability behaviors, pretending to be other things. Now they're more likely to pretend to be this one that is more quiet. So that would be an example of behavioral momentum. Um, other strategies are pre-corrects and transition warnings. So transition warnings are basically just a countdown for when something is going to change, when there's going to be a transition. In five minutes, we're done with math. In two minutes, it's time to start reading. One more minute and we're going to switch to reading. Okay, now it's time for reading. That's a transition warning. It's just a countdown of when change is going to occur. Pre-corrects, on the other hand, are going to describe the expected behavior before the learner needs to use that behavior. So it's not like a correction that happens after the learner has made an error, made a mistake. It's a pre-correct. It's a rule reminder. We are telling them what we're expecting before we get into that situation. Um, so uh, if we go back to our small children in the hallway example, uh, pre-corrects might be the teacher um, at the beginning, uh, before they walk out in the hall, okay, remember when we're in the hallway, we're going to keep our mouths closed and our hands to our side. So, the, and we're going to stay in a straight line, right? It might be like that with my own kids. Um, okay, we're going to go into the store. We are not going to buy any toys or candy today. We are going to get just the things on the list, right? Whatever it is, I'm reminding ahead of time what's going to happen, what the expectations are. You can combine pre-corrects and transition warnings for even more information for the learner to be prepared for what happens next. So in five minutes, we're going to finish math, we're gonna put away our books and get out our reading books. Three more minutes, and then we're going to put everything away from math and get out our reading books. One more minute, and we're going to put math books away and get our reading books out quietly. Okay, it's time to switch to reading. Put your math book away and get your reading book out quietly, right? Combining those two things. These can help. The more information that you provide to a learner can help them be successful with the transition. Nobody generally, I won't say nobody, most people do not do well with a sudden change. If your boss suddenly walked in and said, okay, I need you in this room right now. And you're like, wait, why? Huh? What? I'm not, what? Like, there'd be a lot of questions. There might be some hesitation. You might still go, but you might be very confused about what is going on. So pre-corrects, transition warnings can be very helpful to make that transition smoother for learners and reduce the likelihood of overly adapted behavior. Over-teaching is another technique. 
over teaching is basically practicing to fluency um, and, and making sure that the learner can perform that skill very easily, very quickly, um, almost automatically, so that the learner is less likely to make an error in the future. Um, sometimes we plan for our mastery criteria to be things like 80% of the opportunities. So we're not aiming for 100%. But there might be some skills that we really should be aiming for 100% and over teaching might be a good way to help get us there. So even though I know my learner can stop at the curb and look both ways before crossing the street, I might continue to practice that until it becomes automatic because for one, I don't want to risk my learner not performing that skill. We can't afford to have any errors there because that could be disastrous. So over teaching is a way to continue and it's basically continue to practice and teach even though they've displayed the skill, but to build it up for that fluency and, and to make it automatic for that learner. Not every skill needs to be overtaught. You don't need to teach everything to 100%. Um, you should look to uh, peers and the setting and the community to see what is generally expected in the natural environment and aim for that. But certain things like safety things, we might really want to make sure that we over teach and get so that they are fluent, they are automatic for our learners. Role play is another antecedent strategy, another teaching strategy that can be used to help reduce the likelihood that the individual is unprepared for the situation and then may engage in some overly adaptive behavior. So role play is a way to teach a complex interaction or set of behaviors um, that are going to use component skills that have been previously taught. Role playing, you're going to simulate the situation um, or the naturally occurring event, but you're going to do it under controlled conditions to allow for the individual to practice in the same way with feedback, with supports, with prompting, um, so that they can be successful when the actual event occurs. Role play is really great for practicing events or situations that don't occur regularly or, or don't occur very frequently, but are very significant. So some examples might be expectations around like holidays. Um, so trick-or-treating, wearing costumes, having people come to the door. Um, it might involve medical appointments. So doctor, dentist, self-care things like haircuts, um, things that occur but don't necessarily occur so often that the learner gets a lot of in real life practice right we want to set up some opportunities to practice it before we get into that situation another example might be when you are working with a learner to use um self-management strategies um when they start to feel frustrated then they should X, Y, and Z, how do we problem solve? Those situations might not come up every day. And we don't want our learners to practice the error or make the error in the situation. So we might use a role play to really help them practice that skill in a situation where we can guarantee that they are successful. Um, with role play, you want to make sure that you are defining the skill and the component parts of that skill, describing the different situations um, in which the skill could occur and provide a description of different consequences that might happen uh, depending upon what, what uh, behavior is displayed, right? And you need to know all of these things so that you can explain them to the learner as well. So if we use um, the holiday example with trick-or-treating, um, there are some things, there's a basic rule, a basic expectation of you knock on the door um, and you say trick or treat and they give you candy. But there are some variations to that. Um, if the light is off, you don't approach that house. If 
Um, the, uh, if, if nobody answers when they knock, you might ring the doorbell. Um, if nobody answers for a few min for a minute, maybe 30 seconds to a minute, um, you turn around and leave. Um, if, uh, they, if they open the door, um, you say trick or treat and they, engage in some other conversation or they don't give you candy or whatever it is, then what are the responses, right? There's a lot of variations that could occur. So you want to have a plan for all of those variations so that you can teach your learner all of those variations. Maybe not necessarily right at the beginning, but as you build up this role play, you want to include these variations because we are not setting our learners up for success if we teach them this is how it's always going to be when that's not in fact what happens in real life, right? Now, during the role play, you wanna set the environment up to look like the situation, the setting where this skill needs to, be, uh, needs to occur. Now, you want to try, well, with the role play, you have to start where the learner can be successful. So, if, um, if I'm doing a dentist role play and right now my learner um, does not do well with any of the like dental picks or the little mirrors or anything like that, but they're okay with their toothbrush, then I might start by using a toothbrush. Um, maybe they are not okay with the plastic gloves or um, the little bib thing that they make you wear, but there's some variations of that, or we can do it without those. So you have to start where your learner can be successful. And then as they're successful and they're practicing those skills, in that environment, then you gradually start moving things closer and closer to the natural environment. So I might start with a toothbrush um, because they're used to that, but then I might change that to actually using like the dentist mirror or um, using one of those dental picks or things like that to touch their teeth, right? So maybe that's what I'm doing instead. Um, and I'm never actually cleaning their teeth. You know, you just practice sort of the motion of like, we're going to count your teeth and you touch each one so they can get used to the feel of it, right? Um, trick or treat costumes, things like that. Maybe you start by practicing indoors with no costume and nobody nobody's in costume <laughs> and um and it's indoors and we just walk up to the bedroom door and we knock and we say trick or treat and the um, mom hands us a preferred candy and we get to eat it right then right like maybe we start with that but then we want to progressively move to make it closer and closer to the natural environment but we don't have to have it look exactly like the natural environment if our learner's not ready for that yet. So we've got to start um, and set it up so that it's similar and we can, and we have a plan for making the steps to get it to look more and more like the natural environment. Explain to the learner what you're going to do. Tell them the step-by-step -step process. Tell them that it's pretend. Tell them what you're going to do and how you're going to walk through it practice the situation, make it fun. It should be like a game. It should be um, where they can be comfortable. Um, it should not be super stressful if it is, or if there's a lot of resistance, then they're not ready for that step. You need to back it up and make it um, less like the natural environment and more safe or comfortable for the learner and start there. Um, practice the situation, go through the activity and prompt and support the learner to perform the correct skills or the, the behaviors that are going to help them to be successful in this environment. If you are prompting and supporting them through it, that means they're practicing it correctly, which means that you can start fading out your prompts and they can be successful in that setting. And then you can start moving that setting to look more and more like the natural environment. 
reinforce frequently, reinforce throughout the role play, not just at the end. Again, this is a complex skill that is requiring the learner to pull together a lot of skills that they have used in the past and to put them all together and maybe make some decisions as they go through this process. Like, well, if this happens, then I have to do this. But if this happens, I do this other thing. So reinforce frequently, reinforce throughout, provide lots of social praise um, and tangibles if necessary, toys or items, things that they can um, use throughout. When the individual reaches fluency, then you start moving things closer and closer to the natural environment, continue to reinforce that those skills in the natural environment and provide the supports that they need to be successful. So that's role play. Some other general strategies when you teach new skills that can help make all situations move a little bit smoother, make sure that your learner is paying attention. If you're going to start asking questions or expecting responses when they're not attending to those stimuli, they're not likely to be successful and we haven't done a good job of setting them up for success. You also have to make sure that you're breaking the skills down into the components that the learner can manage, that the learner is ready for. Um, you also need to make sure that they have the prerequisite skills to perform the skills that you are uh, trying to teach. Um, if the learner doesn't have the prerequisite skills and we haven't broken the skills down enough, then we're not setting our learner up for success. We are going to make it harder for the learner to master this skill. And therefore there may be more uh, overly adapted behavior occurring because they don't have the skills to be successful at this level yet. You also have to provide sufficient prompting. So we've talked about prompts and prompt fading. You have to provide the level of prompt, um, the levels of support that that learner needs to be successful. Our goal should be to support the learner so that they are always successful or pretty much always successful and then gradually um, fade out how much support they need from us. Our goal is not to, you know, sort of like grade people for being wrong and, and oh, ha, you didn't know that. Like, what would be the point of that? Our goal is to teach. So make sure that you're providing enough support for them to be successful and then work to fade out that support while the learner is still being successful. There are some other variables that can affect how the day, how the situations are going. These are just some, this is not, um, everything, but things that sometimes we might forget about. Exercise. Sometimes our learners may need, and this, this applies to everybody, okay, this isn't just specific to, the, to your learners, this applies to yourself. Sometimes people need more exercise in order to burn off some energy, or they need certain kinds of exercise or movement um, to get that input that they need and to get out some of that energy that they have in order for them to be successful. Um, so consider that. Figure out what that looks like for your learner. This is where collaborating with others like OTs and PTs um, can be very helpful to determine um, what this might look like for a particular individual. We also need to consider sleep difficulties. Um, sleep difficulties are not uncommon with a lot of the populations that we might work with and support. Um, and just like we don't do well if we aren't sleeping well, our learners might not be doing well. And so that might be a fundamental thing that we need to address first before we can really work on some of these other skills. Um, the same would go for addressing uh, medical issues um, or uh, uh, food sensitivities, anything like that. Um, we might need to address those issues first so that our learner is in a position where they can learn new skills as opposed to trying to make them learn new things when they've got so much going on in their own private environment that they're not going to be as successful. Another way to 
reduce the likelihood that overly adapted behavior occurs is to offer lots of choices. Um, giving the individual frequent choices of what they want to work on next or what materials they want to use or where they want to do it. Um, that can be really beneficial, especially for learners who have people constantly directing what they have to do and when, giving them as much choice and as much say in their day, in their routine, in their life, gives them a chance to be heard and can reduce some of those overly adapted behaviors that occur when our learners haven't gotten to dictate anything about what's going on. Um, and there are some examples there. Also working to teach communication skills. So top priority is for our learners to be able to advocate for themselves, to communicate what they want, what they need, so that they can be understood, we can understand them, and we can then help them get those needs met. So if your learner doesn't have a good fluent communication strategy, that should be the top priority. Once your learner has a communication system, a communication strategy that they can use reliably, then they can better advocate for themselves and we can listen to them and we can um, meet their needs that they are expressing. Um, examples of communication uh, could be as simple as like pointing or guiding, signing, um, handing pictures. It could be saying things. Um, it could be using some uh, like cards, like break cards or um, icons. Uh, but we want to make sure that we are giving, well, not necessarily giving, giving if our learner doesn't have, but listening to, helping to discover our learners' communication attempts, listening to those attempts, helping to expand upon their communication strategies so that they can be their own self-advocate um, and, and express their wants and needs. And then we have to listen to them. And if they can communicate with us and we can listen to them, then we are less likely to um, to face overly adapted behaviors because they can communicate their wants and needs and we can meet those needs. So for the assignments, uh, define behavioral momentum and provide an example. Uh, define the term pre-correct, provide an example. Define overteaching, provide an example. And write a role play scenario for teaching going to the dentist. So again, thank you so much. That was our topic today. Um, if you want to, you can place your responses to the assignment in the comments, and I will be happy to provide feedback. And hopefully you can join us next time and subscribe so that you can see these when they all come out. Thank you.